All right. Well, hello. Welcome. This is Sarah Clark from the Institute for Conservation Leadership. We appreciate that you all have joined today's call. I'm going to do a few kind of welcome housekeeping bits, some intro bits, and then um, Dr. Claire Jantz is going to lead most of the webinar. Sorry, now my coughing fit will start. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, everybody's lines are muted right now. If you would like to unmute your line to ask a question, either at the end of the webinar or in the webinar, you do that just by pressing star 1. Otherwise, we welcome your questions in the chat. That's all the housekeeping. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. I really am having a little coughing fit as we kick things off. So um, I wanted to welcome Dr. Claire Jantz, who is here with us. She is the director of the Center for Land Use and Sustainability at Chippensburg University. And she's also the co-project lead on the Delaware River Basin 2010 project, along with uh, Scott Drizga, who's also on the call. Claire, would you like to say hello and let us know who you have with you? Yep. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, I have two other folks from Shippensburg here with me, um, Antonia Price. Hello. And um, Scott Drizga is also in the room. Hello. Wonderful. Well, we are really excited to do this webinar today because um, Claire and the whole team at Shippensburg have been working on this project for just over two years. And considering that their version 1.0 is launching soon, we know it's an exciting time uh, for the team and for the project. And um, I understand that there's a lot of expertise and experience that the Shippensburg folks bring to this work. In particular, they have extensive expertise looking at land use, land cover change, analysis, modeling, and probably a whole bunch more things, um, including doing this type of modeling in the Chesapeake Bay. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to talk with them. Um, also on this call are a few folks from the coordinating committee. So I've got um, Peter Howell in particular on hand to answer any, um, any questions that might come up specifically for the coordinating committee. We welcome your questions as we go along through the webinar. Um, just feel free to chat them in, and we'll answer some in chat. We'll answer some verbally. And then we'll also have a time of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, just to look quickly at what we hope to get out of this webinar, um, first of all, I'll share a little bit on the Coordinating Committee's perspective on how the land use scenarios can be used to inform focus area selection. And then um, Claire is going to take over, and she's going to share what will be available from Shippensburg University, um, a little bit about the methodology at a, a high level that's, that's been used. And um, we will also look at how the scenarios can inform planning. So they've got some examples to show us. And then we'll finish up looking at sort of the timeline and next steps and how you can access the data and where you can do that. So this is the part um, from the coordinating committee's perspective that I'll just uh, review quickly before we pass the mic over to Claire. Um, one thing that we want to point out is that this is a tool that we hope will support you in your planning. It's not required that you use this tool for focus areas. So um, similar to the SRAT tool, the data is intended to help you come up with your answers versus it's not going to be, it's not an answer machine. Um, and we do note that the timeline is kind of tricky in that, you know, this is all coming online just because you all have already done quite a bit of work on your focus areas and you're getting ready to submit the draft. Uh, the draft focus area. So apologies for the mismatch on the timing, and we do recognize that. Um, <clears throat> when we think about how you might use the information that will be provided, um, one way would be to compare focus areas that you're considering. Um, for example, if you identify a focus area for protection and you see from the modeling that um, development is threatened, and that may make it more beneficial to place a priority in protecting it sooner than later, that might inform you. Um, also for restriction, sorry, restoration or protection focus areas, you might be able to look ahead and see that significant upstream development is coming. And if that does come, it might override 
the benefits of the work that you're doing. So you might, you know, if you were comparing that area to another area, you might pick the other one. Um, it's also, uh, we hope, will be useful for kind of validating the analysis and decision making you're doing now. You can refer to the maps and the tools and, and see what's there. Or you might even use that data to tie break if you have two things that you're considering and um, the development is shown in one of the, the focus areas that might be some more information you could use in your decision making. And um, lastly, I'll say that the coordinating committee, we definitely understand and acknowledge that local knowledge may supersede the modeling results that you get from this, this model. So um, that, of course, um, can be a major factor and will be a major factor in your decision making. So that's kind of just at a high level what the coordinating committee is thinking about how you might be using this tool. Um, now I'd like to turn it over actually to Claire, who's going to dive in and, and, and describe the, the tool and the work that we're going to be seeing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and, and again, thanks everyone for joining in. Um, we are really excited to be able to talk about these products today. Um, when we started this project a couple years ago, the William Penn Foundation was very um, open about an aggressive timeline, and, um, and we weren't quite sure um, if we'd be able to meet that timeline. And I realized that we might be a little bit behind where you guys are, but, um, but uh, I, we've done a significant amount of work, and we're really, um, really excited to share it um, with everyone. This is um, a listing of kind of the whole team here at Shippensburg. Um, uh, Scott is here with me today, and Antonia is here with me today. Alfonso is our GIS analyst and has really been doing most of the heavy lifting with the, um, the, the processing and the, the quantitative modeling with the help of um, Josh Barth and Caitlin Lucas, who are a couple of students working with us on this project. So um, just to give you a really short um, introduction to the CLUS, um, we are actually a relatively new center um, in this current carnation, incarnation. Um, we, we just um, completed our first annual report as the Center for Land Use and Sustainability. Um, and and we, we took an older center and kind of expanded its mission um, and made it a lot more focused on re uh, research, um, interdisciplinary um, research, um, and, a, and a strong focus on sustainability. So to learn more about the center, you can see our website um, at centerforlanduse.org. Um, we'll be sharing another website with you, um, which is drbproject.org, which is your go-to website for everything that has to do with, um, with our work that we've been doing in the Delaware River Basin. Our project um, that was funded two years ago by the William Penn Foundation and we do want to thank them, obviously, for the support that they've given us. This has been a great opportunity. Um, we actually have um, three um, elements of this, this project. Um, one is that we've partnered with the University of Vermont to, do, to, to produce high-resolution LIDAR-based land cover data for the basin. Um, the, the second main component is the work that we've been focusing on um, which is forecasting um, development out into the future. And then we're also going to be working shortly on a feasibility analysis um, to try to see how we can move this framework um, forward in a sustainable manner. So um, I know many of you have already been um, working with a little bit some of this high resolution data. Again, this is the first part of our project um, and uh, that that the University of Vermont has taken the lead on. The data sets that are available now, um, you can get to on PASDA, or you can get th to through our, um, through our website um, products page. Um, the main focus of the webinar today is going to be on our forecasting work. Um, and so we'll be talking today about uh, forecast out to 2070 under baseline conditions. We'll talk a little bit about our approach, the input and the output data, and then also give some example applications. And 
Sarah, when I get to that point in the um, presentation, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add in terms of helping folks think about how they can use it in phase two planning. Um, sure, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll also um, talk a little bit about how you can get access to these data sets and when you'll be able to get access to them and also what's going to be coming next. Um, we're referring to this as version 1.0 because we're already planning on releasing version 2.0 um, that, that, that will help you um, hopefully during the implementation phase. So um, our modeling approach is um, that we have been using uh, what's called the SLUTH model, and SLUTH is an acronym for the key input data sets to this model. SLUTH has been around since the late 90s um, and is a, an open source um, free model. It's probabilistic and it's cell based. So that makes it, um, that means that it's been widely used. There's dozens and dozens of publications using this model. Um, and I've been using this model on and off for like 10 or 15 years now. Um, the fact that it's cell based makes it mesh really well with some of the land use or land cover data sets that some of you might be familiar with um, that are cell based or raster based models or um, data such as the national land cover data. Um, so for example, in this background image, um, 2011 developed pixels are in black and then 2070 are in red. Um, and that's, um, again, sort of reminiscent of, of some of the, the data products that you might be familiar with already. So it, again, matches that um, data format really well. The key data inputs to SLUS um, include developed land cover, transportation network, slope, and then a layer that we call the exclusion attraction layer. And I will um, kind of walk through these um, one at a time. Um, for developed land cover, we are relying on the national land cover data 2001 to 2011 um, time series. The SLUS model um, is pretty simplified in terms of how it treats the urban or developed environment. Um, it really requires a simplified view of being developed or not developed. So we take the four development classes from the national land cover data and sort of collapse them into a single category, um, which is developed, not developed. So what that means is that that's the simplified view that we're giving the model, and that's what the model will output. So we're not getting land use, and we're not getting different intensities of development, uh, and that's one of the limitations of the model um, that, um, that probably future versions of land change models will be trying to address. Um, we also bring in transportation and slope. In terms of a transportation layer, we use um, uh, kind of primary and main secondary roads in our representation. So we're not using local neighborhood roads um, because those are sort of roads that might go along with the development instead of being a, an accessibility factor for new development. Um, the most important input into SLUTH is what we call the exclusion attraction layer. And this is a layer that identifies areas that will either repel or attract development. And so this essentially provides the model with some additional guidance um, to, to, to point it to the best places and to, to have it avoid the worst places for development. And this single layer is actually, um, a synthesis of three main categories of other models. <laughs> so this is sort of a model within a model. We have a model of, um, for example, environmental suitability that we, um, you know, use multiple environmental variables like terrain roughness, slope, soil suitability for development, um, solar radiation, and a few other variables to identify places where there might be environmental limitations to development. 
We also incorporate um, socioeconomic drivers in the form of population and employment forecasts. In these cases, we include um, state level forecasts, or I'm sorry, forecasts from the states um, out to about 2020. Um, and then, because that's sort of the timeline for state forecasts, we then incorporate um, national level forecasts that were generated by the Environmental Protection Agency to extend the population and employment drivers out to 2070. Um, we then also incorporate planning and policy information. So for example, um, any protected areas um, are incorporated into this exclusion attraction map. Um, when we run alternative scenarios, we can um, you know, incorporate additional protected areas or do away with some protected areas. So, so the combination of those three classes of models, um, so this is, again, multiple kind of layers of information that get collapsed into a single overall exclusion of attraction map for development. And just to show you guys what this looks like for um, the basin as a whole, um, in this image, the black indicates um, developed land cover in 2011, and then the color gradations indicate areas that um, exclude or repel development in the greens and yellows, and areas in orange and red are places that attract development. And this is the input that we used um, for this version one um, baseline. Okay, so those are the main inputs into SLUIS. And we then give those inputs to SLUIS. And SLUIS then works um, to kind of replicate the observed patterns of development. And so when we talk about patterns of development, that means is it clustered development or is it dispersed? Um, is it occurring as edge growth? or are new centers being established and growing from there? Is it um, proximate to the transportation network? Um, and then we can also define these drivers of change through the exclusion attraction layer. So those layers go into SLUIS, and SLUIS applies these different growth rules to it to actually generate um, the prediction to 2070. We also note that SLUIS is probabilistic. And so what that means is that if we start with 2011, so this is, we're, we're looking at um, the black is developed land cover in 2011. And then if we look at an individual forecast out to 2070, when SLUIS is um, selecting cells for potential development, it does that selection randomly. So the first thing it does is it selects a whole bunch of cells for potential development, and then it makes a decision about whether or not that cell should be developed based on its proximity to roads, based on the slope, and also based on what, what it says in the exclusion um, attraction map. So if you run it one time, you'll get one result. If you run it another time, you'll get another result. If you run it another time, you'll get another result because of that kind of random nature of how SLUIS predicts where development will occur. We actually end up running SLUIS 100 times. So we don't just make one simulation from 2011 to 2070. We make 100 simulations over that time period. Um, so that's 100 different simulations over 59 modeling years, which generates 5,900 um, individual maps, one for each simulation and for each year. Um, we, those are, that, that, that's a lot of data. <laughs> so um, what, what we actually work with more frequently is kind of a consolidated product that, that looks like this. And what we're looking at here is the probability of being developed by 2070. You can kind of think about this as um, the cell values here. And again, the black is 2011, and then the shades of red are that probability. You can kind of think of this as the average number of times 
a cell is selected for potential development. Um, so again, it shows the probability that a cell was selected for development between 2011 and 2070. Um, it's not a map that shows percent impervious. And I, I included this caveat because um, a lot of us who work with these data sets are kind of trained now to see that 0 to 100 as percent impervious. And, um, and that can lead to um, kind of misuse or improper use of this particular layer. So, um, so it's, it's probability of development. And actually what, um, what we're, we're going to be more focused on is taking this 30 meter data and aggregating it up to those NHD, NHD catchments that a lot of you are probably familiar with if you've been working with the SRAT um, tool. So, um, so this, this image is the same area, but with that development forecast aggregated up to the proportion of those catchments that um, is predicted to be developed in 2070. Claire, I'm just going to jump in and um, see, does anybody have any questions about the methodology so far? Feel free to chat them in or unmute with star one and ask. OK, no one's typing. Please proceed. OK. <laughs> so this is for the, the small sort of square example area. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like for the basin as a whole. Um, aggregated to catchments. So what we're looking at here is the percent developed within each catchment. The map on the left is for 2011, and the map on the right is for 2070 under this baseline forecast. So, so these are the data <laughs> um, that we think would be of most use um, for uh, phase two planning. We have a couple of um, I see someone's typing, so I'm going to slow, slow down. We have a couple of example um, applications just to, again, help us, um, help us as in, as in Shippensburg and, uh, uh, and Sarah has been helpful in this too, to think about how they might be used in phase two planning. So when, okay. So Claire's asking if we have interim projections between these to provide. And we will actually talk a little bit more shortly about, um, about our kind of current thinking about how, how and what we'll be releasing. But yes, we do have interim projections. So if we take a look at an example um, hypothetical focus area, um, and this, this is an area that I chose um, because it's an area that has relatively sparse development. So most of the catchments in this area are in the very low level from 0 um, to 0.05, or that's 0 to 5% or 0.5% developed. Um, so very low levels of development. This is what it looks like in 2011. So this might be in a protection cluster. Um, if we go to 2030, um, just a little bit of intensification, and then 2070, we get a little bit more intensification in the eastern part of this watershed. So if you're in a protection cluster and you see these kinds of trends, um, I could imagine that you would think about um, uh, strategies in a couple of different ways. For example, you might decide to focus less on the eastern part of the watershed because that might be um, turned over to development in the future, or alternatively, you might decide to target those areas more aggressively in order to mitigate some of that development pressure um, moving into the future. Um, okay, yeah, um, and again, these are what we're showing here, and this is scaled from 0 to 1 instead of 0 to 100. But this is the proportion of those catchments that's developed. So if it's in that really darkest red category, which we don't have any here, that would be a catchment that's 100% developed. 
um, whereas sort of the mid-range is, is about 21 to 30 percent developed. Um, I hope that that makes sense to everybody out there. And I don't know, Sarah, if you want to, again, feel free to jump in um, in terms of some of the brainstorming that might be happening in phase two planning. Um, sure, I was just going to say, does anybody, if anybody has any questions, we'll see. I see Will has been kind of typing a bit here and there, and um, feel free to unmute with star one if you'd like to just ask your question uh, verbally, and that's fine. Okay, so um, another um, example um, is uh, a, a potential focus area that is a little bit more developed um, and that you know might be representative of some of the restoration clusters. And again, this is what the development looks like in 2011. And here we do have some that are in that that highest class of 0.7 to 1 or 70 to 100 percent developed. Um, if we look at 2030 and then 2070, um, what we see is a lot more intensification um, in this area. So again, in a restoration cluster, that might help you, um, you know, again, focus on particular catchments um, to either narrow your focus within a focus area. Um, or it might help you in the implementation phase to, um, to, to consider or reconsider how you might implement some of the restoration strategies in order to mitigate future development. We just received some questions. We're taking a moment to read them. Yeah. I'll just read one of the questions as you all are thinking about it. So Claire is asking about um, you can provide two separate maps, one that shows the percentage probability for development on a scale of 1 to 100 percent, as well as a second map that shows the extent of development in the same subwatersheds on a basis of 1 to 100 percent developed according to current zoning codes. Yes. So I, we can provide the um, so the, the percent probability for development, um, that data layer is at a 30 meter scale. So that's kind of the raster, relatively fine resolution. Um, and then the second set of maps would be the, that information aggregated up to these catchments. Um, also, we want to clarify that, that be, because um, current zoning data isn't consistently available across the watershed. That's not something that we incorporated directly into the basin-wide exclusion attraction layer. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Will is also asking or noticing the upper basin development, um, and and I'll just I'll just point out there that. Um, when, if we, if we go back to look at that slide, you'll see that um, at the low end, there's, there, there are very low levels of impervious, of developed land cover. So, um, so I think it makes it look worse than it actually is, Will. Um, so it's sort of going from very little development to a little bit more development in the, um, in the upper basin in particular. Um, so, it, Will, I'm not sure what you mean by prior work. Do you mean in the Chesapeake Bay region or up in the upper Delaware? Okay. Um, we didn't use an impervious conversion factor in that, um, in that work. Um, I, I, I created a linear model to estimate impervious surface from urban, from developed land cover. Okay. 
Okay, I might um, just uh, roll. Right, Stephanie. Sure. The, the categories aren't broken up evenly because the data distribution is not even. So we tried to use kind of a natural breaks um, on that. So let me just let just move forward and, and we'll revisit some of these questions as they um, as they come up. Um, so those are a few examples. What what we're going to be rolling out um, hopefully in the next one to three weeks um, are, first of all, releasing data files, which are going to be a shapefile of those catchments um, with information in the attribute table for the proportion developed in 2001, in 2011, that's our observational time period, and then the forecast data for 2030 and 2070. We'll prepackage that with an ArcMap document so that um, you know users can just download this zip file and then open an ArcMap document to see kind of the percent development that we see in, in 01, 2011, 2030, 2070. Um, and that's something that for advanced users, you know, you can re-symbolize, um, do queries, and all that kind of stuff. So you could work directly with the data. Um, we're also working in-house on an ArcGIS online tool, which is going to be similar to what folks could see in the ArcMap document, um, but that is, is going to be for folks to access just through the web. Um, hopefully available about the same time as the ArcMap document with maybe a little bit of a delay. Um, and then we've also shared these results with the team at ANS. Um, to integrate it into SRAT. That will be available probably in the next two to three weeks. Um, and, uh, and I know we have Lynn on the phone, so, um, so if she wants to chime in on that, that would be fine too. But um, I believe that in this case, um, they'll be able to, cap to capture kind of the upstream impact um, that you don't see by just looking at the data aggregated to catchment. Um, we already have a little bit of information up at drbproject.org products, but that's kind of, again, the page that we're trying to point people to um, to get more information about the, um, the data sets and information about accessing the data sets. When Okay, Rick, Rick is asking if we'll have gridded 30-meter maps available for 2011, 2030, and 2070. Um, 2030, uh, we could do that, um, the 30-meter data. Um, 2011 will just be the urban, not urban, um, but then we could pull together 2030 and then we already have the 2070 um, map prepped. Um, I see a question from Chris Kieran about whether the watershed scale map expresses probability. <clears throat> so yeah, for catchments, um, we're able to, um, to estimate the average amount of developed land within a catchment. Um, when you look at the online tool, um, and also within the, um, the attribute table for our data products, we also have um, a 95% confidence interval. So what we'll actually be releasing is the average amount of development that's forecasted to occur within a catchment, plus or minus um, a certain amount based on, um, based on the variability in the forecast for each, uh, for each catchment. Okay, um, so, so coming out later, and by later um, we mean within the next um, probably two months, um, we will be releasing version 2.0 of DRB 2070. And so this, these are products that might um, 
be useful, again, sort of for the um, impl implementation phase. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, re-releasing the baseline scenario with um, some tweaks that we want to incorporate. Um, we also have a couple of alternative scenarios um, because the recent trends, you know, may or may not reflect what the next several decades are going to look like. So, um, so we did develop some alternative scenarios, and I know some of you guys um, participated in that uh, 2070 um, series of workshops. And then um, also over the next um, two to three years, we're actually going to be um, taking our land use change um, forecasts and combining that with climate change to try to investigate the synergistic effects of land use and climate change on um, forest resources um, and hydrologic processes. So um, this was uh, an, uh, an award that we have received through the Delaware Watershed Research Fund and was really driven by the fact that um, when we are developing our alternative scenarios, um, we, we have really only been able to address the climate change component um, sort of on a peripheral level. And we think that that's going to be really important to understand the interactions between those two um, sort of dynamic um, processes as we move into the future. So, um, so again, that's work that um, will be um, highlighted on our DRB project page as it comes to fruition, but we're just getting rolling with that. And um, <laughs> thanks, Will. <laughs> um, we. Uh, I, again, want to kind of put up this slide that has our team contact information. And I starred Antonia's name because she um, is in the best position to um, provide timely email responses. <laughs> I also, <laughs> also gave her phone number because <laughs> she's the one uh, who is most available sitting at her desk most of the time. So, um, so, so I, I'm kind of putting her in the position of being the primary contact um, because she's the most responsive. Um, but she, she can um, probably, I would, I would guess, be able to address most questions that come up in the near term. And, um, and for questions that she can't address, she can um, certainly shoot that to the right person who knows the answer. Um, here or, or at one of our partners. So um, I think that's all we wanted to cover today. Um, it looks like we still have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, I'm going back to read something that Claire wrote here about the wiki SRAT. Yeah, while you're reading that, I'll just say I invite folks to um, feel free to unmute your line with star one and ask any questions that you have. You can also type your questions in, whether that is about the actual methodology or the data. It could be about what's available and how do you get it. Um, I know in talking to Antonia that we said, you know, Shippensburg will be putting announcements and information out as things are posted. So, for example, in base camp, um, when things are up there, you, you can get a notification via base camp that things are available. Yeah, and, and Claire, we're really excited about the Wiki SRAT. Um, we have been in touch with Stroud, and so we know that, that the kickoff meeting is next week, um, and um, I, I think that we'll be in a good position um, at least um, through June to make sure that our data gets integrated into, um, into the Wiki Watersheds uh, tool uh, in a way that makes sense. So that's, we're really excited about that. I also thought I would just ask folks who are here from clusters um, if you have any reactions that you would share of, you know, when you hear what's available, are you thinking about, oh, there's some places in your cluster where you particularly want to look and see what the modeling is saying? 
Um, any other thoughts or questions when you think about how you might want to use it or what you're kind of itching to look at that anyone's willing to share? Get a couple people type some things in. So um, looks like we're going to hear a little bit from a couple people. I will say just um, in wrap up, we'll, I'll be posting the recording of this. And then, like I said, as, as things are available, we will be posting notifications to Basecamp and also, of course, reach out to Antonia <laughs> um, with any questions you have um, or any needs you have. Yeah, I'm just going to put the screen up so everybody can get her phone number, uh, <laughs> direct line, and um, and and I think once this uh, webinar link is available, this will also be going up on our website. We also have a PDF of um, of this slide deck up on our website now too. Great. I can see a couple things are coming. Um, I don't know if Peter or Claire, if there's any other thoughts you have from the coordinating committee about what you're excited about when you see this. Um, I'm not saying you necessarily have to <laughs> type in any, but if there's anything. I know Claire, you, there's a number of pieces moving and potential for how this will be continue to be used and inform the basin going forward. All right, so Rick is saying that the gridded data would help for evaluating or ranking the potential for individual projects. Is there a time frame for the availability of that data? Yeah, it, that should be the same time frame um, when we release um, okay. the, the catchment data. I think we do, that, that the 30 meter data should be used with, um, you know, we we know that when people get the 30 meter data, they're going to be overlaying it with parcels and parcel boundaries, and um, and and at that level of detail, um, you, you do need to take it with a grain of salt. Um, we we didn't use parcel boundaries when we generated the forecast, so um, you know you you could maybe interpret it as a um, you know, as differing levels of future growth pressure, but it probably shouldn't be used to identify, you know, this parcel is definitely going to be developed <laughs> in the future or not, because it's really not a, um, a, a parcel-based model. So, yeah, so that should be available. Um, we're shooting for the end of next week for those um, zip files to be available on our on our website. Great. Um, I'll just do a little advertisement. Um, I will say that the coordinating committee left the winter gathering with some clarity about some really hot questions folks had and some of those things people were thinking out about, particularly regarding complementary strategies, focus area selection, and the outcome metrics committee. So I'll just say we are working on getting some QAs out next week, um, and um, ideally even a webinar uh, week Friday on complementary strategies, which will be recorded. But, but we know there's a slew of cluster meetings coming up the week after that, so we just wanted to get some more information out to you in those means. And then your point people will also have all that every cluster's point person will also have that information and be able to answer questions and talk with you about that. Okay, and Rick has given a little bit more information about what they're looking for. I think the, it looks like the last comment might be Will's. All right, well, as that, um, Will, we'll wait and see what, what you're saying here, um, but I do want to um, thank Claire and her whole team I know this is a really significant endeavor, and you all have put a lot of work into it. When you're talking about the number of maps, I was like, yes, that is a lot of data. <laughs> so um, we're appreciating that all that is, that two years of that work is culminating. 
Um, I will, I, there's a question here from Will, and I think we'll stay on and read through that and answer that. For those who are um, leaving the webinar now, I'll, I'll say thank you um, for participating. And anyone who wants to stay and hear Claire's reaction to what um, Will is typing. And Claire, if you can, I guess I can read it. Um, so, I'm scrolling. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Let's see, so Will is asking um, about thresholds in the headwaters and the zoning planning component. And Will, as you know, um, we're, or well, I, I guess you probably do know that we're working directly with, uh, with PKC um, to do some um, kind of more tailored modeling work in, in that particular cluster where we are incorporating some zoning and planning information. Um, it's, it's still relatively core scale, but, but that's information that we can incorporate as long as the data are available. Um, but uh, you probably also know that getting that data available for the entire basin is, um, is a huge challenge. I'm, I'm excited to, to hear uh, and to work with, um, with Stephanie's group and Jane Marie's group on their um, regulatory work that they're doing. Um, yeah, Pocono Kittatinny Cluster, thanks. Um, and for the forest hydroclimate work, um, what, you know, one of the things that we're really interested to explore there is that idea of, um, of critical thresholds. So, for example, the scenarios that we're running um, for, this, for this project um, have really more been focused on sort of what we might expect to see in the future, sort of in the, you know, in the range of reality and planning and visions and, um, and, and things like that. But, for the um, for the for the um, forest hydroclimate project, um, we will have the opportunity to test, you know, kind of scenarios of land change that are more focused on identifying what some of those thresholds might be, um, in particular in the in the um, northern part of the watershed. So we can follow up with you later. I'd be happy to share our proposal with you um, uh, with that for that work. Wonderful. Excellent. I see Peter Howell is typing. He might want to just press star one and tell us what he was going to say. And then that will be the last comment if he unmutes. Peter? <laughs> Here, just press star one and use your words. <laughs> all right, cool. I was going to say, we're all waiting now, bated breath, of what you're going to say, Peter. Um, <laughs> well, we'll, look, <laughs> we'll look forward to hearing that. All right, everyone, thank you for joining the webinar. And um, you have engineers. Um, email and phone number uh, so you can reach out to her with questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. For joining.